Well, good morning. What a great day at Downstate. It is my honor to uh, preside over the second Joel S. Levine, MD, Distinguished Health Policy Lectureship, named in honor of a, a great physician that I had the honor and pleasure of knowing since 1993. I knew uh, Dr. Levine since 1993 when as a second year resident, I was uh, elected to the Residence Council of the American College of Physicians. And Dr. Levine, a distinguished uh, internist and gastroenterologist from the great state of Colorado, was the chair of the Board of Regents of the American College of Physicians. And little did I know, sort of 10 years or 12 years later, that I would have the honor of serving as president of the American College of Physicians. And so I always looked up to Dr. Joel Levine as one of my mentors, one of my heroes in medicine, and as life's wonderful sort of fortuitous situations occur, in 2007, as you know, I joined this wonderful community as president, and one of the first people I got an email from was from Joel Levine. And Joel said, Wayne, congratulations. You're president of my alma mater. I had not known that Joel had been a distinguished graduate of the College of Medicine here at Downstate. And so it, 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 another source of connection that I always treasured with Dr. Levine. And then later on, uh, I never forget, I had the wonderful uh, conversation when I called him to say that Upon my recommendation, the Board of Trustees of the State University of New York had authorized me to confer upon him an honorary degree. And I called him, I think it was February, uh, and I just remember, I, it took me a day and a half to track him down, Dan. He was in clinic, and then I called here, you know, but I got through at Denver Health. He was at Denver Health at that point. He called me back about a day later. He said, oh, Wayne, so sorry. I heard you've been trying to find me. I said, yes, Joel, I have great news. And... Uh, Dr. Levine's son is here, uh, Dan, and, and Dan, I, I never forget his reaction. He just started giggling. You know, your, your dad was such a, a wonderful, authentic guy. He said, you've got to be kidding me, Wayne. I said, no, Joel, I'm going to award you an honorary degree. So I just treasure that conversation. And then, um, again, another conversation we had a little later when uh, he called me um, quite stunningly to say that, uh, that he had been diagnosed with a terminal illness and that he wanted to do something here at Downstate to uh, further health policy and discussions on health issues uh, in his honor. And I said, Joel, we'll be honored to do so. And he said, I have a suggestion for the first speaker. And I said, well, yeah, look, I'd love to hear your suggestion. He said, well, my niece is the secretary of the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. Dr. Mandy Cohen. And of course I knew who Dr. Mandy Cohen, I just didn't know it was Joel's niece. And I said, that is amazing. We would love to have Dr. Cohen as the first lecturer. And so my task now is to introduce Dr. Levine's niece, but more importantly to the health of the nation and the world. On Janu June 16th, 2023, the President of the United States announced his intent to appoint Dr. Mandy K. Cohen as the director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And we are honored today to have the CDC director with us uh, to uh, bring reflections about her uncle, but also to introduce our featured speaker who you will hear about in due course. But a little bit about the CDC director. Um, again, appointed by the President of the United States, uh, Dr. Cohen is one of our nation's top health leaders who has broad experience in leading large complex organizations and a proven track record of protecting Americans' health. Prior to joining CDC, Dr. Cohen served as the executive vice president at Allidade and CEO of Allidade Care Solutions which is an independent primary care, excuse me, an organization focused on helping independent primary care practices, health centers and clinics deliver better quality care to their patients and thrive for value-based care. Prior to that, Dr. Cohen served at the Centers for Medicaid, Medicare and Medicaid Services, 
where she was the acting director of the Center for Consumer Information and Insurance Oversight. And later, and at, before that, or subsequent to that rather, she was the chief operating officer and chief of staff of, the CM, of CMS. Basically, she ran CMS on a daily basis. Again, a high level federal appointment, critically important to the health care of all Americans. She's had too, too many honors for me to rattle off today, but just a couple. 2019 Modern Healthcare named Dr. Cohen one of the top 25 women leaders in healthcare. Um, from her alma mater, her public health alma mater, the T.H. Chan School of Public Health at Harvard, she received the Leadership in Public Health Practice Award from Harvard School of Public Health. She was named Tar Heel of the Year in 2020. And that's a big deal if you're from North Carolina, by the way. That is a really big deal. Uh, because that's how beloved she became in the state of North Carolina during the COVID era when uh, we would see Dr. Cohen on CNN or MSNBC or Fox News, and she had this amazing ability, in spite of the uh, sort of the political dynamics of the great state of North Carolina, to speak plainly so that everybody understood, whether you're rural or urban, or you lived in Charlotte or, or Salisbury, you got it when Dr. Cohen gave a briefing about COVID and how you should protect yourselves and your family. She is an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine and continues her academic appointment at the Gilling School of Global Public Health at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Uh, she's a native New Yorker, a graduate of Cornell University for her undergraduate degree, uh, went down the road to Yale University School of Medicine, and then again, her master's uh, at public health at Harvard she trained in internal medicine at Mass General. She is a, not only is she an outstanding public health uh, leader, she's a wife, a mother, a niece, a sister, a cousin, and one of our nation's most outstanding health leaders. So it's my honor to introduce the CDC director, Dr. Mandy Cohen. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Wonderful to be here. Thank you, Dr. Riley, for that kind and well uh, long introduction. Um, but thank you for that. And it's wonderful to be back at Downstate. Um, first, let me say a few words about um, my family's connection to Downstate. As you heard, all, my, my uncle um, was here for medical school and grew up not very far from here. Um, and without having a university that made it financially possible for, our, for him to enroll here, as well as join then the military, um, I don't know if he could have made the impact he did in, over the course of his career. So he, owed, he very much wanted to make sure he was giving back to Downstate that helped him. Um, but it wasn't just him uh, that has a connection here. I also want to recognize his sister, my mom, who's here. Um, my mom trained as a, one of the very first nurse practitioners at Kings County. She was in the burn unit, and it was, I think, the second class of nurses, before they even had the term nurse practitioner, that did additional training to, um, to work independently. And, you know, I not only watched my mom in her clinical career, and she still remains the best clinician in our families, just so we're clear. Um, but I watched her advocate as well, right, to change the system. And what she was really advocating for was the fact that we have, we have a lot of, of, of health threats um, here and abroad and that I think about now as CDC director. There's a lot of work to do, and it is a team sport. Protecting and improving health is a team sport. And I will say, unfortunately, here in the United States, we often aren't really acting like a team all the time. That's part of what I hope to do as CDC director and learn some lessons from um, the COVID work is that silos hurt us in our terms of our response. Um, we had great experts, but maybe we weren't working as coordinated as we possibly could as a team, both uh, here in the United States and globally. Um, but when I think about my mom's career and thinking about her interest in changing the system and making sure that everyone um, was included in helping make communities healthy and safe. Um, I'm grateful to be walking in both my uncle's footsteps as well as my mom's. Um, so I want to recognize both of them. 
I also want to recognize my dad, who is here too, who also was the one who said, you can do anything you want. And I believed him, and so I'm standing here. <laughs> my, cousin, my cousin Dan, whose uh, Joel's son is here, grateful for him and his support of, of the lectureship. Um, and my sister is here as well. But I'm excited to introduce to you the first non-family speaker <laughs> for the Joel S. Levine Lectureship. And when my uncle and I, before his passing, talked about this lectureship, he really wanted to make sure it was to bring to downstate folks who were in the arena, who were really trying to change the way the system operated, who were um, passionate about changing the system for everyone. Because I, as I said, I don't know we even have a system, but it's certainly not working for everyone. But there are amazing leaders out there who are trying to change the system each and every day. I see some of them in the, this audience. But I'm excited to introduce you to Dr. Adaje, um, who has been a longtime friend, um, a hero of mine, um, and it's just an incredible human being who every day wakes up thinking about how can I make the world around me better. And so I, she was at the top of my list when I talked with Joel about this lectureship. I, I used her as the example of a person that I would want to come here to represent his legacy. And I'm so grateful that as soon as I texted her, she was said yes. And it is very fitting that she is um, the first non-family member to give this lectureship. She is like family to me. I am honored that she is here. I, we're going to do a formal introduction, and they'll read her whole bio to you. Um, as a family physician, she has a doctor of philosophy, um, and, and, she, and as a family physician. But what I want you to know most about Toyin is about her heart um, and about how fierce she is. Um, it is a tough to be a woman leader, but to be an African-American leader in the space that she is leading is just incredibly inspiring to me. And I'm, every day, I'm just grateful that she is a friend. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to, for you to hear the formal introduction of her, but grateful for everyone to be here today, for you to hear Toyin's amazing story about the work she's doing at City Block and changing um, um, the world uh, one patient at a time. And I just want to say thank you again to Downstate for, for hosting this lectureship. Um, maybe I'll come back after my, my CDC tenure is done and talk a bit more um, about what we're trying to accomplish um, as well in terms of uh, protecting the country and improving health. But with that, who am I turning it over to? Okay. Thank you so much. Good morning. It is true, Dr. Cohen and I were communicating, uh, uh, trying to get Dr. Adaji uh, to be included in this thing. And literally 15 minutes later, she, she calls back. She said, well, we got her in, in an email. I was like, OK. I guess that actually means something to have friends like that. Uh, Dr. Toyin Ajahi. Um, Dr. Toyin Ajayi is the co-founder and CEO of CityBlock, a value-based healthcare provider for Medicaid and duly eligible beneficiaries in underserved communities. CityBlock's integrated and tech-enabled care model meets individuals where they are, delivering highly personalized medical care, behavioral health care, and social services to members in neighborhoods where it's needed most. Prior to City Block, Dr. Ajahi served as Chief Medical Officer of Common, Commonwealth Care Alliance, a nationally renowned integrated health plan and care delivery system for individuals eligible for both Medicare and Medicaid. In this role, she led clinical operations, spearheaded care delivery innovations, and oversaw multidisciplinary teams of clinicians, community health workers, and administrators. In 2023, this year, Dr. Ajahi was named to Modern Health's list of top women leaders in healthcare. Stats status list, so I'll repeat that so it's clear. Stats status list, so say that 12 times. Uh, 
and the Aspen Institute's of newest class of Henry Crown Fellows. Dr. Ajahi also serves on the board of directors for Evelent Health. And if you're interested, that's NYSE EVH. So if you're looking for stock, there you go. Is a member of the Congressional Budget Office's Health Panel of Health Advisors and is a co-founder of Coalition Partners, where she invests in and mentors early stage entrepreneurs. Additionally, she has published and spoken extensively about her work in caring for populations with complex needs, including at TEDMED, NCQA, Oliver Wyman Health Innovation Summit, TechCrunch Disrupt, in the New England Journal of Medicine, and in the Journal of American Medical Association. Dr. Ajahi received her undergraduate degree at Stanford University, a Master of Philosophy from the University of Cambridge, and her medical degree with distinction in clinical practice from King's College London School of Medicine. She's board certified in family medicine and completed her residency, in tra uh, res residency training at Boston Medical Center and continues to practice primary care with a focus on patients with chronic, complex, and end-of-life needs. Without further ado, I present to you, and we, are, we welcome her to Downstate, Dr. Toyin Ajayi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Um, note to my office to send the abbreviated version of the bio next time, please. Um, <laughs> well, it's, it's such a privilege to be here. Um, uh, really, President Riley, thank you so much for, for hosting me. Mandy, how fortunate am I to have a friend like her? Um, uh, she is as much a mentor and an inspiration to me as, as anyone I can think of. Um, it is such an honor to, to be giving this lecture for you and your family in, in memory of your uncle. Um, Dr. Levine, who sounds like a really incredible person. I'm truly honored to be here. Um, and with that, I will try to make the most of this really incredible opportunity and share a little bit about what I've learned in my journey so far in, in building a health model that seeks to disrupt our existing status quo. Um, and, and maybe um, we can enter into some of a dialogue about what it looks like to do similar in your own communities and spaces. So thank you. Um, a little bit more about my background, the stuff that's not on the bio, just to give you context for where I'm coming from. Um, I went to medical school, like many, many in this room, out of a desire to help people. Um, I believed that the training that I was receiving would position me to have an impact. Um, I grew up in Africa. I grew up at the height of the AIDS epidemic. Um, I grew up seeing people die. Um, uh, when I was a kid in Nairobi, the average life expectancy was about 35, 36 years. Um, my sisters and I would drive to school and we would see kids who looked just like us, um, who were hungry, who were not going to go to school that day, um, weren't sure where they were going to sleep at night. And the mantra in my house, household, very similar as I can imagine in yours, um, was about our obligation to be of service to others. Um, we talked about social justice. We talked about um, the privilege that comes along with having a roof over your head and three meals a day and what that obligates us to do for others. And I went to medical school believing that this would be the culmination of a desire to be of service. Surprisingly, I found myself as a resident and then as an attending physician, seeing patients in a safety net hospital, not dissimilar to the institutions in which you all operate, and seeing the same things happen over and over and over again. I would see a sick person come to my door, um, either in my clinic or in the, in the intensive care unit or in the hospital where I was serving patients, I would diagnose them with a condition that was horribly advanced. I would share with them that, that things were dire and difficult. I would watch them struggle. I would write a prescription. I would discharge them from the hospital. I would write a discharge summary. And I would wait, knowing that they would come back again. And that if not that same human, certainly the same circumstances would return. It became very clear to me pretty early in my career that the system that we have built is not working. And my entire career thus far since then has been about trying to understand that and then trying to disrupt that. And so I hope that there's um, lessons in here that resonate for many of you all as well. Not to be an alarmist, but I think there's, there's some alarming things that are happening right now. Um, we've all been through the pandemic. We learned a lot. I think many of us who are healthcare providers, many of us who are thinking about health policy, we're not surprised by the things we learned. 
How many of you here were surprised when the first data came out that showed that black and brown communities were more likely to die of COVID than their wealthier and whiter counterparts? Anybody surprised? I was not surprised. Um, how many of us were surprised when we found out that essential workers, the people we rely on for our daily needs, were more likely to be exposed to the virus and had no recourse? Nope. How many of us are surprised when we find out that folks who are struggling with homelessness or mental illness were more likely to suffer? That there's a life expectancy gap is immeasurable at this point. There basically are hardly any studies that even seek to measure this. Last time I looked, it was 20, 25 years difference for someone with serious mental illness, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, than someone who does not. We weren't surprised. And why? We've got a whole bunch of things going quite wrong that we need to start to address pretty quickly. Some examples. Um, we know that trust in our healthcare system is at an all time low. Um, at a moment in time when many of us, uh, myself included, were volunteering across the street in the emergency room at Kings County um, and in the inpatient units taking care of people with COVID and urging people to get vaccinated, folks were going on YouTube and Twitter and who knows where else and taking advice about boiled cabbages and um, uh, other non-medically um, uh, validated sources of information for health. They weren't looking to us. They weren't looking to doctors. They weren't looking to public health experts. They were looking to peers. They were looking to Nicki Minaj on Twitter. They were looking to Fox News and pundits who had nowhere near the training that we had. People weren't coming to us. And I think many of us felt frustrated. But the reality is this was, again, a long time coming. Trust in the healthcare system at an all-time low, and we'll talk more about that. Healthcare workers are in crisis. Um, we read about burnout. We read about um, the folks who left the healthcare system as providers and aren't coming back. We read about the massive gap we have and will have in years to come as our physicians are aging and retiring and folks are not replacing them. We see the United States as the only um, industrialized developed country that is seeing sustained declines in life expectancy that have not bounced back since the 2020-2021. Um, and certainly are disproportionate, wildly disproportionate to the amount of money we spend on healthcare. We're seeing disparities that suddenly persist. Not a day or a week goes by that there's not a headline somewhere that tells us about a disparity in health outcomes. Race, ethnicity, rural and urban status. We see this over and over and over again. I was rereading um, uh, the, the Institute of Medicine report from 1990 on unequal care, unequal health. And it was the first, I think, big piece by a scientific kind of um, institution to really, really get into the literature about healthcare disparities. And nothing has changed. That was published in 1990. Nothing has changed on every single measure for every major disease. We see massive, inexplicable by biology disparities between black and brown people, folks in rural and urban settings, people with mental health challenges and people who don't, people who have disabilities and people who don't. We have made no, no impact whatsoever in changing those and our costs continue to rise. And I think about you know, um, my nieces and nephews, they're six. I think about um, uh, what folks are gonna say about us and our generation in years to come. I'm a physician. I'm both accountable and also culpable for what is happening right now. And I feel personally that we're running out of moral standing. I wanna be able to say to my kids and my grandkids and my family that I was doing something. I was trying. I was in the arena, to your point. We're running out of time and money and moral standing. We cannot say we don't know better. And so we have to start to do better. The status quo is really, truly failing all of us. And I'll spend the next few minutes just sort of talking a little bit about why it doesn't work for anyone, not for the physicians, the advanced practice clinicians, not for the patients, not for communities, and what we need to do about this. But first, I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story um, of a patient who I cared for. This will probably be, gosh, maybe 15 years ago now, who stayed with me and will continue to stay with me. I can remember her face like it was yesterday. I know her name. I remember everything about her story. Um, and this is what her sort of problem list looked like, um, you know, in the medical sense of the word. We would describe her as a 42-year-old female. I'm 42 years old. She had severe asthma. She had allergy. Um, she had had multiple emergency room and ICU visits with respiratory distress. Um, she would come in and 
we could almost copy and paste the plan of care forward. Everybody knew what to do. She'd come in in respiratory distress. They would stabilize her pulmonary issues, give her medications. She'd been frequently intubated, um, needed aggressive management in the ICU to, restate, to return her, her oxygenation. She'd get discharged with a referral for primary care doctor follow-up. Many of us did that as re residents and medical students. You call the office, you get the appointment, you put it in the chart, you check the box that say you did it. There we go, we've just got follow-up care teed up. Um, we'd counsel her. Hey, you know, your urine toxicology when you came in showed benzodiazepines, cocaine, you name it. You should stop using drugs. Do you need some help? No? Okay, fine, cool. Catch you later. Um, she'd had counseling attempts. She often left against medical advice. Um, on a number of occasions, she would feel well enough in the ICU, she would self-extubate, and she would leave. And gosh, we hated that. So frustrating when patients leave against medical advice. It's so, like, why don't they listen to us? Goodness gracious, we take it as an affront, right? We accost them in the hallway and make them sign a form that says, you know, if we die, it's not our fault, good luck with you, and off you go. Um, again, studies show lower income folks, people of color, people with mental health challenges, five times more likely to leave the hospital against medical advice. It's not their fault, it's our fault. We gotta, we gotta really think about that. But this was her story. And then there would always be a little footnote. P.S. Someone should think about referring her to outpatient behavioral health at some point. You know, we just, let's just let that go. But every clinic that I've ever worked in, the therapist's office is like a closet somewhere in the basement, and the wait is usually six weeks, thereabouts. You never know what happened, because they go see the person, you can't see their notes, they never tell you what, who knows. So, Basically what we're saying is someone somewhere should send her to a black hole somewhere and, um, and good luck with that. And this is what happened over and over and over again. And the, the pattern was so persistent and repetitive. I started to look at the words that were coming up in her chart over and over and over again against medical advice. She's a poor historian. Um, she's non-compliant. This patient has a flat affect. She's withdrawn. These are the words we use to describe people in the healthcare system who kind of piss us off because they don't listen and don't get better, for whom we don't know what to do. And these very negative descriptors, the title, the term non-compliant, we find those again more likely in whose charts? People of color, people with mental health challenges, and people with low income. We use that language that disparaging language, much more often to refer to certain types of people. These structural biases, again, reinforce that sense of mistrust, because guess what? She overheard them say that to, about her. They know what they, they, she knows what they say about her. I wouldn't want to stay in a place where people are kind of implicitly blaming me for the fact that I cannot breathe. I'd also prefer to go home. I thought maybe, what if we rewrote her problem list and her story from the perspective of a human being, just talking to another human being. She's a 42-year-old mother of two. She's a trauma survivor. She's doing her very best to keep the wheels on the bus. She's got two young children. She's raising them alone. She watched her brother um, succumb to gun violence when she was a teenager, right in front of her. She never got bereavement supports. This was ubiquitous in her community. No one thought to say, do you need a therapist? Let's talk about how you're feeling. She has nightmares about that day to this day. She has challenges accessing social services, not enough um, resources for transportation and childcare. When she's in the emergency room, she's thinking, who's gonna pick my kid up from school? Who do I trust to go get them? When she feels well enough to self-extubate and pull all the tubes out, she's trying to get home to her kids or to work a job so she can feed them. She's at risk for eviction. She's living on the precipice. You can't spend that much time away from work and hold a job, even if you are sick. She's got panic attacks, anxiety, and PTSD. And buried right in the bottom of a social worker's note one time, I found in her chart that she had a cat that she was allergic to, but who was her only source of comfort. And she would let the cat sleep in her bed, and her asthma would get worse and she'd come back to the hospital. And like so many people accessing the healthcare system, she had had lifelong and persistent experiences with racism, including in and from the healthcare system. And we're just scratching the surface of our understanding and appreciation of the impact of systemic racism as in itself a trauma that causes poor health outcomes and that is also transmitted systemically through families. We're just starting to understand that, but it is pervasive. So what if we thought about her like this? What if we understood her story like this? 
What would have been different about her care? Would we have accompanied her differently? Would she have actually gotten the mental health supports that she needed? Would someone have said, let's talk about this cat. Let's understand the therapy needs. Let's talk about your PTSD. Let's make sure you have a childcare plan for when you get sick. We didn't do any of that. And the reason I ended up this deep in her chart was because Sonia, this patient, this is the name I use for her, she passed away um, at 42. She left two kids with no mom. And I have no idea what happened to these kids, but I can guarantee you that they're at incredibly high risk of showing up exactly the same way that she did. And that we do this over and over and over again in our healthcare system. I personally was traumatized um, when I started to really understand that this is what I'm doing all day, this is what I'm part of all day. And I think as we're increasingly understanding the root causes of burnout in healthcare workers, stories like this are part of that. We're starting to describe what we're seeing in the unprecedented rates of burnout and dropout from the healthcare system uh, by physicians, by advanced practice clinicians, by nurses, as moral injury. And when I read this study, there was an article um, published in STAT in 2018 um, uh, that cited work by a number of researchers that just like, it was one of those moments that was like, aha, this is a language to put, this is the words to put language to what I'm experiencing. What they found was that, um, that actually came out of the military. Um, uh, veterans coming out of the Vietnam War had higher rates of post-traumatic stress disorder than from any prior conflict. And that the rates of PTSD were out of proportion to the amount of actual violence that these soldiers had witnessed. And psychologists were starting, they were confused, they were trying to understand this. So, so you weren't on the front lines. You didn't have a near-death experience, and yet you come back and you're exhibiting the same sort of symptoms we expected to see from people who were really exposed to very, very intense combat. What's that about? And they started describing this as moral injury, that there is something that is so potent and toxic about an experience of fighting a fight that you don't believe in, doing work that is not aligned with your internal values, getting up every day, crack a dawn, taking the bus, the subway, shoveling your car out, and driving to a hospital to provide 15 hours of care to patients whom you don't actually believe you can help because their problems are so great, because the time is so short, because the conditions in which you are caring for them are so misaligned to the outcomes that you're seeking to, to address. That creates what we call moral injury. And what we're finding is that this failure to consistently meet patients' needs has a profound impact on physician well-being, and this is the crux of moral injury. Again, the data are what they are. We're seeing burnout rates in every subspecialty, particularly primary care subspecialties, that we have never seen before, and they're continuing to rise. We are running into a crisis here, truly, where we will struggle to have enough people who want to do the work of caring for our communities, and it's because of the circumstances in which we, they operate. Doctors today don't work any harder than doctors did 40 years ago. Our shifts aren't any longer. But something about the nature of our work is causing injury to people in the system. I think that's so important for us to internalize. It's harming us. It's harming us economically, too. Um, this is a slide from 2014, um, published in Massachusetts. It is so old because I believe that is the only time that any state has published data that looks like this to own up to what's happening here. What we see here is we see a rise in healthcare spending that comes at the expense of every other social service, comes at the expense of investments in law and public safety, comes at the expense of investments in human services, in education, in public health, in mental health. This is what happens not just at a community level when we have healthcare costs go up and no resource, it's a zero sum pie, no resources left to spend on other things, this also happens at the household level, where um, middle and lower income American families are spending way more on healthcare than they can afford to do, and that they would be doing in any other industrialized country, in any other country that has the resources in place to make it be otherwise. The out-of-pocket costs, um, the co-pays, the drug bills, the cost to get to, to the doctor's office, cost for long-term care and supports for your family members who are ailing and aging, um, not to mention the opportunity costs, the time you have to take off work, the fact that we don't have paid family and child leave, um, uh, bereavement supports, you name it. We're, we're paying so much for healthcare, it is failing all of us. 
And so we have to do something. And I believe that the moment for disruption is now. I'm inherently, I think anyone who um, gets up every day and does a startup, um, gets up every day and works in a government job, um, you have to be an optimist at heart. And I believe there's a real opportunity for disruption and for change. And that's the thing that gets me fired up every day to go do the work that I do. We have a huge need. I hope I've convinced you of that if you needed convincing. Um, and there's massive, massive opportunity. We have tailwinds. We have lessons to learn. You know, COVID was devastating for so many reasons, but one thing it has done for us is allowed us to have very transparent, clear conversations about the disparities that exist in our healthcare system and in our society and our need to do something differently. We have to take advantage of that momentum while it's still fresh in our minds. And that's a real opportunity for us. There are policymakers and leaders who see an opportunity to, to ask for more, to push us to do better. We take those as tailwinds. We take those as an opportunity. There's an ecosystem ripe for disruption. Everybody needs change. Um, if you're a health system and you're worrying about what do I do with nursing staffing shortages? How do I retain a healthcare workforce? If your concern is, gosh, my ER is full, my waiting times are through the roof, or I've got a readmission rate that's unacceptably high above the benchmarks. We're all thinking about the same problems. We're coming at them from different angles, but there's real momentum to solve them. And then of course, there's a profound opportunity, I think, by doing work that is disruptive and transformational to have real generational impact measured in human potential. And this is of course the thing that motivates me more than anything else. And so what we have done um, at CityBlock, and I'll tell you a little bit about that work, <laughs> is try to innovate to create a path to transformation of our healthcare system. Starting pretty small um, and building from there. Um, I recognize that, that when you are trying to do something that is so diametrically opposed to the status quo, that that's a hard thing to do. But it's also the right thing to do when the status quo is failing us as profoundly as it is failing us now. And so um, uh, about seven years ago now, um, uh, myself and a number of, of other individuals came together, uh, my co-founders and I, to build CityBlock, um, based on the fundamental belief that healthcare is a basic human right, and that the disparities that we're seeing in care are unacceptable, um, especially in a country that has the resources that we have, the profound resources that we have, and the profound opportunity that we have to do more and to do better. It is unacceptable that we see what we see in our system today. And so we decided that we would seek to build um, what could be a prototype and hopefully a scalable model for how we can sustainably deliver personalized, respectful, dignifying care to marginalized and low-income communities. And underneath that is that real recognition, as I started to establish earlier, that when we see and when we look at the impacts of all the systemic Issues that we talk about, racism, lack of access to education, to transportation, to social services, the vulnerability that certain populations have, that that converges with people of color. It converges with people who live in urban sp spaces, particularly patients who come to institutions like this. And that this work is social justice work, if we could get it done right. Um, we decided um, to take what was kind of an unusual approach, I think, for me personally, which was to do this in a for-profit model. Um, prior to this, I was, I'd worked in nonprofit health systems, community health centers. I'd started a nonprofit myself. Um, I did not personally understand the mechanisms of capitalism and how they play into anything around healthcare. I'm just going to say that. You can sort of guess and understand my political leanings. But um, it became very clear to me that the one thing we can agree on here in this country, even more than we can agree on the idea that healthcare is a basic human right, we can agree on the right and the ability to make a profit doing something, providing a service. And that if we could harness that fundamental, very American drive around capitalism, that we could create an engine that is self-sustaining. Because I don't believe that we should have to go over and over and over again to ask for philanthropic dollars and resources to help us build small programs here and there to serve, to plug gaps in our healthcare ecosystem. There are enough resources for us to fund this and fund it in a scalable and sustainable way. I thought that was really, really important and a real challenge, I think, to me personally in how I think about this. What we've done is built um, a care delivery model that provides primary care, behavioral health, and social care to marginalized individuals, people who receive their care through Medicaid and who are duly eligible for Medicare and Medicaid. 
um, uh, now in six states in the country, um, five states in, the, in Washington, D.C., um, and, and really focused on, on those principles that I talked about, asking ourselves the question of, take that patient whose story I told you earlier, what could we have done to make her life outcome differently, and what can we do to ensure her kids don't suffer the same fate? Let's do all of those things, and let's figure out how to pay for that so we can scale it and sustain it and learn from it. So what we do is we partner with health plans across the country. We serve now nearly 100,000 members. Um, we're in Indiana, Massachusetts, New York, North Carolina, Ohio, Washington, D.C., very different places. Um, core sort of tenet here is to try to prove that it's possible to do something that works in such a heterogeneous environment. It works in places that have expanded Medicaid, places that haven't yet, but will soon. Um, it works in places that have, um, you know, much more conservative leaning kind of politics and viewpoints, places that are much more liberal and, um, uh, and, and more expansive in their coverage. We've got to figure out how to make something that works for all people, as many people as possible. And what we do is, um, is we provide care to, to folks with complex health needs. So 90% of the members whom we serve receive Medicaid. Um, or Medicare and Medicaid. If you are over 65 and you get Medicare and Medicaid, you are both a senior and somebody living in low income um, settings. If you are below the age of 65 and you have Medicaid and Medicare, it's typically because you have a disability. Um, we serve about 50% of our members have a severe behavioral health need, so folks with a serious mental illness and or a substance use disorder. 85% um, of the folks we serve have two or more chronic conditions, diabetes, hypertension, heart failure. Um, and 62% of the folks, when we meet them, in the moment we meet them, tell us they have an acute social need. And it's something like, I'm about to lose my housing. I have no idea how I'm going to get to my next doctor's appointment because I cannot spare the $2.90 to get on the subway to get there. I'm hungry, and I don't know where my next meal is going to come from. We have built a model that's focused on serving communities that have lower access to care. 80% of the members whom we serve um, identify as people of color, um, and we've therefore built an organization that reflects that demographic. We have an incredibly diverse workforce um, that reflects the population whom we serve. Um, and we've been able to really see impact now. And I'll describe a little bit more about the model and how it works, but what we've been able to do is demonstrate that we can engage people um, we're about able to engage about 90% of folks who are sent to us, so very high complexity people, people who typically don't answer the phone when you call them, um, may not come in for their follow-up appointment, um, have, may not be willingly accessing the healthcare system, um, and we're able to do, ca provide care for them um, in, a, in a way that really resonates for them. We have a net promoter score, which is a sort of um, a, a, a metric for satisfaction of 80, um, so that means that folks are highly likely to tell someone else that they really, really enjoyed their experience with us. It's not the perfect measure, and I'll talk about a little bit more about that in, 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 in subsequent slides, but it is certainly a really important indicator. And we're now driving um, medical utilization down. We're keeping people out of the hospital. We're keeping people out of the intensive care unit. We're helping them live healthier lives, and I'll talk more about how we do that. So what do we do? So we start um, by finding people. Um, when you think about, again, that, that, that patient story I talked about, you know, she left the hospital against medical advice, where does she go? She has a piece of paper that says you have a doctor's appointment, you know, in seven days with Dr. So-and-so. She may or may not have ever seen that person before, may not know their name, may not have the, tr the money to get transportation to go there, may not be able to take the time off work. We start by engaging people and engaging them in relationships of trust. Um, that means that we humbly seek the right to get to know what matters to them. And we seek their permission to be engaged in their lives. So we don't start by knock, knock, knock on the door. Your diabetes is way out of control. Let's talk about why you're not taking your insulin. We start by saying, how are you doing? What matters to you? What's keeping you up at night? How can we help support you? And we lead that outreach with a team of folks who are not clinically licensed or trained, we specifically select for their empathy, for their incredible tenacity, for their community spirit and their obligation to working in communities. We call them community health partners. Um, and we equip and empower them to go build that relationship with the members whom we serve. They sound just like you. They have lived experience. They grew up on the same block. Um, they're not here to preach at you or to make you feel bad. They're here to earn the right to learn more about what's going on for you. And we use that entry point to then deliver services 
that are tailored to their needs. Um, be that primary care or mental health, or more often, the first thing that folks need is, is social supports. Let's get you the food pantry. Let's help you figure out how to get to the doctor's appointment that you have for your cancer treatment. Let's figure out what matters to you and solve that problem, and let's do it as immediately as possible. We also recognize how important it is to catch people when they're in the hospital and how important and pivotal that moment can be. And so we, we invest in facilitary, rounding in facilities and hospital facilities. Um, we get a notification when someone hits the emergency room um, using our technology, and we try as much as possible to actually show up there physically and meet them there. Um, that familiar face, that kind and loving presence, that person who's going to help you transition home um, if you need it, it makes a world of difference. And so we really, really aspire to be that person, that port of call for folks, so that if for whatever reason you're leaving the hospital and you can't get your meds or you don't know how to get transportation to get home, we can actually solve those issues for you and we'll come to your house in a few days' time and make sure that everything's going as it, as it should. We use data that's interoperable with electronic health records so we understand what's going on for people. And that is inclusive of behavioral health data. I think that's so important. I wonder if the doctors who were taking care of that patient I described earlier really understood the extent of her trauma and her PTSD and her mental health challenges and her substance use disorder. They may have been able to connect the dots a little bit better and more quickly for her. Maybe her outcome would have been different. But we're siloed. We don't see each other's data. We don't see each other's information. We can't connect the dots. We really try to make sure that that, that, that integration occurs. And then we commit to being available 24-7 for our members. You call us night or day. We will answer the phone. We will talk to you about what your needs are. We'll evaluate you. And if necessary, we will send someone physically to your home, usually an EMT or a paramedic, um, who has um, the ability to take, an, to take an EKG, to take labs, to coordinate with a physician in real time, to solve that problem for you so you don't have to leave your house. And then we're physically in the communities that we serve with neighborhood and mobile hubs where people can come in for care, but also come in for social needs to be addressed. And what that allows us to do is through this sort of continuum of care, provide segmentation so we understand who's risks, who's high risk, who's medium risk, who's lower risk, use the data to inform our outreach and our onboarding, do assessments of people's needs holistically, where we privilege their social needs alongside their medical and behavioral health needs, and then provide the care that folks need, including the transitions of care if they ever go to the hospital. We've also um, put a lot of investment into um, high acuity care. I think this is really important. No one likes to go to the emergency room, wait for sometimes hours, not really knowing when they're gonna get seen, get taken care of, often in a way that feels cursory, and then get sent back out into the world to go solve the problems that they came in for in the first place. Um, and so we really recognize that when someone puts their hand up at any point to say, I need help, that is a huge opportunity. And the more that we can keep that care in the community, in their homes, the better able we are to integrate and synchronize those services in the long term. And so we're really, really focused on providing what we call our ED at home services for folks who would otherwise go to the, to the, to the emergency room for their need. Um, they need care in the evening, out of hours. There was a study actually a few years ago um, uh, that looked at PCPs in Brooklyn um, to find out what proportion of them, what pr proportion of primary care practice offices had availability to see patients in the evenings and on the weekends. It was 16%. So if you have a problem for most of the patients whom we serve and you call your doctor's office, you're waiting a day at best, more often it's a week, 10 days, two weeks, to get seen, and you gotta take time off work, you gotta get somebody to watch your kids, you gotta get transportation to get there, and you get 10 minutes of what often feels quite unsatisfactory at the end of the day. And we really need to break that cycle, and we've really tried very hard to break that cycle by ensuring that people get real-time access when they need it, in their homes if possible, um, in a way that is definitively able to solve their problems. I think another key part of our model that is so powerful is this you know, behavioral health and substance use disorder integration. Um, I think we're increasingly through um, the pandemic recognizing how important mental health is. Um, and we're finally talking about it, acknowledging it, um, and truly starting to provide care. But we have an access gap. We have a major problem. We do not have enough providers um, to care for people with, with serious mental illness um, in a real-time fashion. Many folks who struggle with addiction um, uh, go to the emergency room. 
to get initiated on medication-assisted therapy for opioid use disorder, as an example, or for alcohol, that's not necessary. You can get that care actually in your home if you have a team and a system that's equipped to do that. So we've really, really built a model focused on ensuring that we can provide that level of care to people in their homes where possible, in real time as much as possible. And the logistics associated with that are really complex. Um, uh, we, we have a program um, that focuses on long-acting injectable antipsychotic medications, which we know are for first class treatment for people with schizophrenia in particular. Um, when we surveyed our members with serious mental illness who were on oral daily pills for their antipsychotic medication and asked them, did you know about long-acting injectable antipsychotics? Very few of them did. They had never been told about it. These are folks who've been in and out of the hospital with mental health challenges for years. And these drugs have been available for a really long time. We actually then looked at social workers and psychiatrists in the inpatient setting and said, well, why don't you prescribe this? Well, it's really hard to do. It's really complicated. You know, you got to make sure a person can follow through. We, getting the pharmacy to deliver the med so we can deliver it in time, getting the prior authorization, it's too many hoops to jump through. We just can't do it. So we, we sometimes tell people about it, we refer them out, and tell them to ask their psychiatrist outpatient about it. And of course, the system perpetuates itself. When I think about health equity, I think about this example. This is not, there's not some magic bullet, silver bullet somewhere. This is, why don't we take the best of what we know for patients and make it available to people who have the highest barriers to accessing it and who are often the most likely to benefit. So what we did was we built partnerships with pharmacists, we trained up our teams, we created an algorithm to identify people who might be eligible for this treatment, we actually tested and iterated on a script to engage them and talk to them about it, counsel them. And then we put in place a program where the minute somebody says, this is something I would like to try, that very day, we get them that med in their, in their arm. We get the pharmacy to deliver it, we get the paramedic to get to their house, we get an EKG, we check their baseline lab stat, we counsel them, we have a face-to-face -face visit with a psychiatrist, we prescribe it immediately, and they get the med that day. And we come back in a month and we do it again and we change people's lives, right? They're no longer in the hospital, they're back to work, they're able to go back to their daily lives. It is so profound. We've done the same thing with medication-assisted therapy for opioid use disorder and for alcohol. Again, this is not rocket science. We didn't invent a new drug, but we are able to make a real difference by just asking the question, what are those barriers to access? Another example, um, and this is another patient story, I guess we also called her Sonia, it's my favorite fake, fake name, <laughs> um, is, is actually a person in Brooklyn um, uh, who, who we have been caring for now for several years. Um, we've been trying to find her for years. Um, she was uh, jokingly um, and affectionately dubbed member 17 because when we got her, she had had on average 17 emergency room visits a month for the preceding three years since we cared for her. She was in and out of the emergency room. And we tried, our teams will talk about the ways they tried to find her, um, and she dodged us. Her number was always changing. She'd say, I'll meet you at the, um, the Dunkin' Donuts over on such and such, and she wouldn't show. Oh, I'm at the McDonald's at Atlantic Avenue, and someone would go over there, and they, and they couldn't find her. Um, and we were, we were chasing her for, for, ye for months and months and months trying to find her. And finally, um, engaged with her and figured out what was going on. And what was going on? She was struggling. She'd had a lot of trauma in her life. She had some mental health challenges that were undiagnosed. Um, she was homeless, um, and she'd had really bad experiences with the shelter system, so she refused to go there. She would work during the day, um, any odd job she could find. She would panhandle, sometimes she would prostitute um, to raise money to get a hotel room for the night. And on the nights when she couldn't get a hotel room, or when she'd been exposed to an unsafe environment, had maybe been assaulted, um, when she was hungry and lonesome and scared, she would go to the emergency room because we've created a system in our society where if you're hungry, lonesome, and have no place to sleep, the only place you can go and be guaranteed that someone will act like you matter, will spend a minute to ask you what's wrong, will give you a sandwich and a place to lay your head, is the hospital of all places. This is what, this is what we do in our healthcare system. And this is where she went. She's a smart woman. She's savvy. What I thought was really interesting and we figured out as we got to know her was that she had a legitimate mental health need and she actually qualified for supportive housing. Now, I live in Brooklyn. Many of you do, I'm sure, too. Many of you know how hard it is to get housing in New York. Did you know there are 2,600 
open supportive housing units in New York in any given night. These are apartments, single occupancy rooms that are set aside for people with mental illness, that are fully subsidized, that are empty. Why are they empty? Has anyone here ever filled out a medical necessity form for housing for someone with mental illness? Okay. It takes hours. You have to do a full psychosocial evaluation for this person. You have to document everything in, it, in just intimate detail. You have to fax it to this number, not that number, this number. You have to wait for the fax that comes back that tells you you did something wrong. You gotta fix it again. You gotta send it again. Then you gotta change the date because it was the old date and it's now the new date. How much does a community mental health psychiatrist get paid to see a patient on Medicaid for a 50 minute visit? 80 bucks. Do they get paid to fill out a form? No. Do they get paid to fax a form? No. This is health equity. We have apartments open for people who qualify because they have a mental health need, but we have not set up a system to put those human beings in a safe place. So what did we do? We filled out the form. And we dogged and dogged and dogged until we got our housing. She hasn't been in the hospital since April 2020. Not once. She got COVID during the pandemic, she came to us. We provided care to her in the community. We supported her, we got her connected with the food pantry, we checked in on her every single day. She now looks out for other members in the same unit that we've been able to house more and more people. This is the work. But if you think about our existing system, it doesn't support any of this work getting done at all. Not because the psychiatrist is a bad person and didn't want to get this person housed. Not because the ER doctor who saw her every other night for three years didn't really deeply care. They care deeply, but what are they supposed to do? They have no tools. We haven't created a system to enable them to actually do the work. And this is why we have to transform. What we have is a once in a generation moment for each of us as leaders in healthcare. And I really believe that when I talk over and over again about sort of what my personal legacy must be, at a minimum I have to be able to say I wasn't just sitting down doing the same old thing every day. I was trying, I was in the arena. And I think we all have to be able to say that of ourselves. I'm gonna spend one minute, a couple minutes maybe talking about measurement because I think this is really important. Um, we measure what we value, what we measure we achieve. And so when I talk about all of these things that we're doing, the next thing that comes to me is, well, okay, so what, what can we all do? What can you all do in your own domains, in your own work, in your systems? And the first thing that, that the sort of precedes all of this is, well, what are you measuring? Do we have performance measures that are aligned to whether this person, this member, this patient got housed and stopped coming back to the emergency room? If you work in the ER, is there any metric at all that focuses on how many people who were here last month didn't come back this month because we solved their problem definitively? I would wager the answer is no. If we're discharging patients from the hospital, what are the metrics that we're looking at that say, okay, well, did we take care of their problem such that they don't need to come back to us? Did they actually go to that appointment that I made for them seven days in advance without really talking to them about whether they could get there? Did that work out for them? No, 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 we get measured on, did you check the box that said they had a discharge appointment? Did you check the box that they were on the ACE inhibitor and the beta block and blah, 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 blah? But like, did they pick up the med? I don't know. Did they take it and is it working for them? I don't know either. We've got to think about measurement if we're going to transform. And of course that ties to data and of course that ties to all of the limitations that we have in our existing system, but it is so, so, so critical. The next thing I think that's really important about measurement is trust. We talk a lot about that relationship and that engagement um, and ensuring that we have earned the trust of the members whom we serve is an essential component to delivering care to them that makes a difference. And defining trust will be, I think, a real cause for all of us and a real important opportunity for all of us to actually make an impact. Trust for me has been, has been very, very, very sort of um, important topic of study. Our team is actually working on building a new metric that we hope to start to validate and test out um, uh, for this because there's actually nothing that's sufficient in the healthcare system. Nothing at all that's sufficient in the healthcare system to, to really show us if we're doing the thing we're supposed to be doing which is earning the trust 
and the right to care for the people whom we serve. We talk about um, uh, the net promoter score. You heard me cringe a little bit. I don't like it. It's not good enough. We have to ask, do our patients trust us? Are we worthy of their trust? And in so doing, do we then have the tools to deliver the care that they need? There's lots of def definitions about trust, um, but overwhelmingly, I think the sort of definition that resonates for me is this is a social bond indicative of someone's ability to believe in or rely on the character, the ability or strength of someone or someone. Do I believe that you have my best interests at heart? That's it. And it would be, it's astonishing and I think maybe not surprising, but certainly it's a source of, of real consternation for me. When you ask that question in healthcare, how few patients say that they have someone they trust? When I was a hospitalist, um, I, I sort of had this hypothesis that I could predict who was gonna have a poor outcome, who was gonna get readmitted, who was gonna come back in worse condition based on two questions. I would ask every patient I admitted, do you have a person in your personal life who you trust, who you could call day or night, who would show up for you, your ride or die? Do you have a person? And the number of people who do not have a person at all in their life who they trust is astonishing. The second question I would ask is, is there a person in the healthcare system who you would say the same about? Could be the person at the front desk of your doctor's office, could be your primary care doctor, could be the nurse, could be the phlebotomist who takes your labs, who if you saw them, if you bumped into them on a random Tuesday outside of the clinic, they would know you by name and they would come over and say hi and you'd be happy to see them. And most patients say no. They don't have a person. They come to the clinic and the person's changed. There's a new doctor, there's a new provider, there's a new person, there's no one. So how in the world are we gonna work with someone and convince them to tell us their deepest, darkest truths? To open up to us so that we can actually engage them and help them. To, to listen to us when we say, you know what, I really think you should take the COVID vaccine. I know that the internet says otherwise. I know that Fox News says otherwise. I know that your neighbor says something else. Trust me, I have your best interest at heart. This is gonna be good for you. We couldn't even do that because we don't have that basic foundation of trust in the healthcare system. This trust is so important. And again, when we look at, um, at race and ethnicity, people of color, less likely to report having trust with of their providers. Um, and we've actually been able to see a correlation between medical errors, health outcomes, readmissions, and trust. How do we do it? We have to start first by asking humbly of ourselves and of our patients in our interactions, do they trust me and have I earned their trust? And then we've actually got to start to deliver care really differently. The other thing that I want to ask is, um, is about trust in our patients. This is another really interesting um, uh, study um, that I found that looks at psychiatrists and actually asks psychiatrists working with people specifically with, um, with opioid use disorder and other substance use disorders, do you believe in your patient's ability to get better? And the physician and the clinician's inherent belief or trust in their patient actually is correlated to their outcomes. So we have to believe in them as much as they have to believe in us. We have to really unlock this conversation in a very different way than we have been doing before. This is not a, I'm over here in the white coat across the table doing things to a person and they either accept or deny it. It is, we're actually in partnership. We're in collaboration here. There's a relationship here. That is so, so, so critical. I'm gonna skip through some of these slides but I can make them available later. There's a lot of data here about confidence in the healthcare system and how that's been eroding over time. Um, and, you know, the COVID pandemic, again, I keep saying it over and over again, just showed us just how far off base we are um, from where we need to be in terms of having the trust and the confidence of the population whom we're seeking to serve. And so I'll leave you with, um, with a couple thoughts. First, um, let's do the work. Revolution is not an event, it's a process. We don't wake up overnight and have a different healthcare system. We work at it, we chip away at it, we start by understanding what the antecedents of the problem is that we're dealing with today are, and we continue to invest over and over and over again, humbly, in seeking to find the right answer. I'm gonna share a video. My depression and anxiety got worse. Constantly feeling alone. Abigail trusting in me was based on me having patience and listening. 
She was somebody that I can express my feelings to, no judgment. She told me about the limitations of food resources, so we set her up with the City Block Hub Pantry. I was able to finish high school. She has helped me finding a job. But the most thing that I'm really proud of that she trusts me with is all of her mental health. She was able to help me get in touch with a therapist, with a doctor. My anxiety has gotten better. She has inspired me to put myself out there. And I'm just excited for the future, for what comes my way. So with that, I thank you for your time. I hope that um, we can together get on the path to a transformation of our healthcare system for the benefit of those who deserve it um, and for our own sakes, because I think as we, we've talked about, this is as much a, a moral issue for each of us in the healthcare system as it is about serving communities. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you for a terrific uh, uh, presentation, wow, and the amazing work that you and your team at City Block are doing to really do something innovative that on its face seems like it's simple, but it's hard, right? It's hard. Right? So do you have time for I maybe do. one I or do two have time questions? questions yes. Yeah. Uh, one or two questions. Um, uh, please, we have one microphone over here, and, and Calvin, do we have a, a portable mic anywhere? Yes, back there. Sir. All the way to the back there, in the middle. Yeah. the anti-abortion laws, especially states which have a six-week uh, uh, and the only reason for termination has to be the threat of imminent death. There was an article in the New York Times yesterday about women with severe uh, preeclampsia, women with uh, you know, dead fetuses who couldn't terminate pregnancy. It's, most of the uh, litigation which is occurring in some of the states is being done by Planned Parenthood and the ACLU. The medical profession is terrified of political uh, threats in, I think, 16 states or 17 states with this six-week limit. Uh, uh, I mean, I think what has to be done uh, was actually a second editorial, second editorial New England Journal of Medicine about a month ago, and that is doctors must do what is correct for the patient. That's right. Irrespective of the law if necessary. If the law is an immoral law, as Martin Luther King said, one doesn't have to obey it. What you have to do as a physician is put your patient first. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, I th you, you, the point that you make, I think, speaks to the broader issue around politicization of what should be healthcare. And I think that's equally a challenge you know, when I think about the space that healthcare providers, practitioners, experts, scientists should occupy, and the space we today occupy, it's really concerning to me, right? Like, we, we are um, way down the rung when it comes to um, uh, our voice and our perspective really being understood. And I think it, again, speaks to trust and to credibility. Um, we have to seek to reestablish science healthcare medicine as credible in and of itself, um, irrespective of politics, irrespective of even economics. And we haven't done that um, for reasons that are, I think, insidious and confusing. Like we've really allowed so much of the practice of medicine to get subsumed by politics in a way that is really, really dangerous and detrimental. Um, what gives me hope though is um, as of this month, I believe, there are only 10 states left that have not expanded Medicaid. So all the vitriol, you know, the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, this is, we won't do this, we don't like, actually, we all as human beings want the same things. We want access to care. We want to be treated like we matter. We want the ability to live long, hopefully, and healthy lives. We want our families to be cared for. And if we can go back to those kind of uniting principles, I think we can create some common ground that allows us to create a political um, 
uh, counterweight to some of the stuff that's happened in and around healthcare. I think we have time for one more. Yes, sir. I just want to begin by thanking you, Dr. Dai, for a fantastic talk, really inspirational. And uh, we just started for the very first year this fall um, our inaugural cohort of a Masters of Healthcare Administration program here at Downstate. Um, and many of our students I know are listening on Zoom as we, as, as you've spoken with us today. Um, it's really an exciting for us, a time for us here at Downstate. So I want to ask just your um, guidance to those students coming into the world of healthcare administration. Dr. Cohen had mentioned uh, the mentorship you offer for healthcare entrepreneurs. We have many that are arriving to Downstate now to receive their education. Curious around your thoughts um, and uh, advice for our next generation of leaders. Thank you. Yeah, I think, um, uh, first of all, I think it's wildly exciting. Like, I, um, I speak to medical school students frequently, and I think there's a little bit of there's some cynicism and, um, and a lot of burnout, of course, that pervades thinking about healthcare. There's no greater calling and no greater profession than to be in service of our community and in caring for their health. And that is in whatever way that you do that, um, as a, you know, a, a healthcare administrator, as a physician, as an advanced practice clinician, as a nurse, um, as, as a unit clerk. This is such important work. It's hard work, it's heart work. And so I'm, I'm always really encouraging of people to do this work. Um, and I believe that things are gonna get better. And I think that the, that the world they're gonna come out into practice into is gonna look really different from the world that I trained in. Um, the thing that I um, encourage folks to do more than anything is to really, really seek out opportunities for interdisciplinary learning. Um, it was so wonderful to, to talk with you about what it was like to be a nurse practitioner um, early in the, in the days of that and how much backlash you experienced. And, um, and it saddens me to say that we still haven't quite gotten over that yet in healthcare. We haven't figured out how to value equally the voice of a community health worker alongside a social worker, alongside a physician, alongside a nurse, because we each play a very different role and each is integral in making sure that our community and our patients are better. And same goes for administrators. We find these like adversarial relationships more than anything else where there is so much good work to be done and everyone has a role to play. And we don't yet in health professions training actually give people exposure to interdisciplinary learning. Like the doctors are over here doing residency, the nurses are over here doing their internships. Like, why don't we actually have people go through training as a cohort of interdisciplinary teams where we understand what other people do and what we can lean on and where we learn to respect each other's various competencies so that we can together form a stronger team. I think the, the evidence behind team-based care is incontrovertible. And I think as we continue to start to focus on outcomes as opposed to just the transactional work we're doing, as, as we continue to say, okay, well, if I care about this patient getting relief from their um, psych psychosis associated with schizophrenia more than I care about did I see 15 patients a day, we're gonna really have to rethink how we organize the work to focus on interdisciplinary care. And so I would just urge these students to take opportunities to learn about other roles and other professional skills and figure out how they fit in such that they can really um, drive and be part of high-performing interdisciplinary teams. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.